Welcome to Treatment Talk, a live bladder cancer video chat from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. These Treatment Talk discussions really are unique in that they feature medical experts. Tonight, we have Dr. Kamal Pohar and Dr. Ann Shukman with us, and also some patient advocates to talk about their experience. And they're really meant to increase your understanding of existing and new treatments across the spectrum of a bladder cancer diagnosis and to showcase patient questions that you can ask in advance to help you be empowered in making decisions regarding your treatment and care. And then we also wanna highlight some current treatment advances for bladder cancer. We would like to thank our sponsors for the Treatment Talk series, the EMD Serono Pfizer Partnership, Merck, and Urogen for their support of our program for this year. My name is Stephanie Chisholm, and I'm the Director of Education and Advocacy at the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. And today's treatment talk is really focused on the long-term management of urinary diversions. And bladder removal is really the gold standard of care for people, especially with non-muscle invasive disease who have high risk disease. And, um, you know, they're really, it's getting closer and closer. And obviously for those with muscle invasive disease. And so we really wanted to try to showcase some of the long-term issues that you should be aware of as you move forward if you haven't already had your diversion. So tonight we have um, Dr. Ann Shuckman from the Keck USC School of Medicine and Dr. Kamal Pohar from The Ohio State University, along with two patients, Eric and Linda, who are going to be sharing their stories. I'm very excited to have you all here. So welcome, Dr. Shuckman, and welcome, Dr. Pohar. It's nice to see you. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shuckman to start tonight's program and just give a little overview of the radical cystectomy and what some of the common concerns and issues are that people should be aware of. And then Dr. Pohar will talk and then the patients will come back on. So I'm going to turn off my video and let you take over. All right, great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And I'd just like to say thank you to Beacon, Morgan, and Stephanie for um, inviting us tonight and giving us the opportunity to do this session. And I want to say in a special thanks up front. So I certainly don't forget to Eric and Linda for being willing to um, come on this webinar with us and share their experiences. Um, let me work on sharing my screen. I have some slides first. Um, okay, so as Stephanie mentioned, um, tonight we're going to talk about urinary diversions and really focus on long-term complications associated with urinary diversions. And we're going to split this a little bit into um, two sections tonight. We're going to talk about sort of mechanical or surgical type complications, and then longer term metabolic and infectious type complications. Um, so we'll jump right in. You know, as we all know, the goals of urinary diversion after bladder removal are to preserve function for patients, whether that's sexual function, bowel function, or urinary function, to increase everybody's acceptance of getting a cystectomy if needed, allow timely use of adjuvant therapies after surgery, achieve low complication rates, and achieve the best quality of life for patients with a urinary diversion. Yeah. Options for reconstruction include an ileal conduit, an orthotopic neobladder, a continent cutaneous diversion, otherwise you know, usually known as an Indiana pouch. And these can be created either with an open technique or a robotic technique. Short-term complications um, can include things like urine leak, bowel leak, acute infection, or dehydration. We're not gonna focus too much on that tonight. As I mentioned, we'll focus on mechanical issues such as ureteroileal strictures, peristomal hernias or stomal stenosis, functional issues such as incontinence, hypercontinence or retention and bowel dysfunction, and then non-mechanical issues such as um, metabolic problems, urinary stones or infections. So ureteroileal stricture is a type of problem that can happen regardless of the diversion type that you have. The incidence of this um, issue is about 5 to 15% in most described surgical series. And usually this problem happens in the first year after your reconstructive surgery. And what this problem is, is a stricture that develops where the ureter is sewn on to the bowel segment used for the urinary diversion. The way this presents is with dilation of the kidney system on the affected side 
And this um, can be picked up just on x-rays, such as this x-ray where we see, you know, one side is much bigger and more full of dye than the other, indicating poor drainage. Or it can be picked up due to recurrent urinary tract infections um, or a worsening of kidney function in the immediate post-surgical year. These strictures can be uh, handled in several different ways. Sometimes we're able to manage them what I call percutaneously. So either um, going through the back and placing a nephrostomy tube directly into the kidney and then trying to come down from the kidney to the diversion to use a wire and either a laser or a balloon to dilate the stricture. Um, these percutaneous type of interventions have a little bit lower success rate if the stricture happens to be on the left side, if it happens to be a longer stricture, or if that kidney is already not working too well. Strictures can also be fixed um, in an, just with a, you know, going right back in either robotically or with an open surgery and reattaching the ureter to the urinary diversion. And this uh, usually involves cutting out the scarred part and then simply reattaching it. And this works really well. Um, you know, obviously you need to undergo a surgery um, to have this done. And so sometimes we kind of try to delay this, but when we do have to resort to this, it's about a 93% success rate. Might be a little bit more successful if patients have not had a prior attempt at laser or balloon dilation. But again, it's a big surgery that people have to go through. Let's focus now a little bit on some issues with ileal conduits or urostomies. And I like this photo and it's really topical this week since it's Halloween. Um, urinary diversion, I mean, a urinary conduit is urine that drains to a bag on your abdomen. And this is a really happy patient. He has his stoma on the right side, looks like it's in good shape. His bag is hanging on in good position there. And so is his jack-o'-lanterns. Unfortunately, things aren't always um, quite this perfect. So patients can develop problems with a hernia around the stoma, which can create issues with the bag staying in place. Um, potentially it can create bowel problems with obstruction or diarrhea. Due to the contact of urine with the skin at the site of the stoma, patients can develop skin issues. Uh, this is really an extreme case where you see this encrusted skin. And unfortunately, this patient had had some problems. And then instead of coming to us actually to deal with them, kind of just kept getting the hole bigger for the wafer and then more and more skin got affected. Um, or patients can have problems with prolapse of the stoma and skin irritation. And the prolapse is pretty uncommon. The skin irritation, I think, is, is, is a fairly common issue. Um, focusing on peristomal hernia, the incidence is really all over the map in studies that are done anywhere from 4 to 50% in series. Um, that's because probably only about, I don't know, 4 to 10% of patients may have any symptoms related to the hernia. But if you do CT scans, which everyone is having for surveillance for their cancer, there may be what's called a subclinical hernia, meaning it's there on the x-ray, but there's really, you can't notice it as a patient and there's not any issues. Several things that can happen, maybe bowel obstruction, pain, bulge at the site, or problems with the stoma bag leaking. There are options for repairing a peristomal hernia. You can do this with a traditional sort of open surgery where you either move the stoma to the opposite side and fix the hernia. Um, there's minimally invasive ways to fix these hernias going in if possible with uh, either laparoscopic or robotic surgery and placing mesh inside the abdomen to block that hernia site, but not moving the ileal conduit to the opposite side or to a new site. Um, and then, you know, because this can be such a big problem for patients, there have been several groups that have looked at ways to prevent this prophylactically. Um, there have been several studies looking at putting in mesh actually at the time of surgery, at the time of creation of the conduit, but rather than waiting to have to fix the problem down the road. There was a study out of Sweden that showed actually with this prophylactic mesh placement, they were able to reduce the hernia rates by about half at the time of um, follow-up for ileal conduit operation. So we can talk more about this in the chat later. Um, so again, possible disadvantages for, for um, urinary diversions. And this is a patient cho choice tool that actually Dr. Pohar um, 
introduced me to several years ago. So you can see that about 15% of patients complain of a symptomatic hernia and a very low number, 3%, may have some tightness of the stoma with an ileal conduit. Um, with what's called a continent cutaneous diversion or a catheterizable stoma, there can be other types of uh, complications. Usually these diversions are made out of colon and the stoma can be brought up either to the belly button as in this picture or to a small stoma in the right lower quadrant. And then a patient passes a catheter through that stoma several times a day to empty the diversion. Um, issues that can come up long-term include leaking from the stoma or incontinence, stricture of the stoma or stenosis, or metabolic abnormalities just due to the nature of using colon as part of the diversion. Many of the issues with, sto with the stomas can be handled just in clinic or with a minimally invasive type of um, procedure under sedation. If there's a lot of leaking for the stoma, often we can inject things like collagen or other bulking agents um, in the submucosal uh, area through a scope, either in the clinic or again, under sedation in the operating room. If the stoma is too tight to put the catheter in, we can usually um, dilate this in the clinic or again, you know, do a very small type of procedure under sedation rather than having to revise the whole pouch. And major revisions are, are fairly rare with the Indiana pouches. And how about neobladders? So the number one reason people often don't get a neobladder is for fear of complications. And whether this be a fear of incontinence or a fear of having to catheterize, patients are certainly on both ends of that spectrum. We've looked at functional outcomes in lots of different hospitals and academic groups in terms of continence with neobladders. So in the most ideal situation, institutions report about a 96% incidence of daytime continence and about a 75% incidence of nighttime continence. But this is really numbers that are created in high volume centers, high volume surgeons, you know, potentially with the most um, sort of perfect data collection. Um, we did a study at USC looking at continence in all comers for uh, all male patients who have had orthotopic diversions who were coming to see us for their follow-up. So this wasn't really a selected group. It was just anyone coming into the clinic for their follow-up, kind of regardless of how far they were out from the time of surgery. These are patients um, who had a cystectomy between 2000 and 2015, and we looked at about 200 patients. We gave patients a pad questionnaire to quantify what type of pad, how many pads, the size of the pad, um, and we looked at different time intervals when we did the analysis. And interesting, what, what we found out is that really the daytime continence for males with neobladders didn't get to its peak point, which was about 88%, until 12 to 18 months after surgery. So I think it's really important for providers and patients to know that the expectation is that this is kind of a long game with a neobladder. It's not gonna be perfect right away. And with nighttime continence, oh, I don't know if I can go back. With the nighttime continence in red there, you can see that actually it didn't peak until even longer, one and a half to three years after surgery. And that number was about around 60%. So there is um, you know, more nighttime leaking than daytime leaking for patients. Um, the catheterization rate for our neobladder patients long-term was quite low in men, only about 13%. But most men didn't have to start catheterizing right away. Many didn't have to start catheterizing again until almost a year and a half after surgery. In women, the catheterization rates with neobladders are much higher. This study um, states numbers almost as high as 70 or 80%, but I think that most series state that the numbers are more around 20 to 30% of women who may need to catheterize. And we've looked at what we can do in terms of surgical innovation to try to prevent hypercontinence or retention in women patients undergoing neobladder surgery. So we're starting to really look more extensively at whether preserving the female sexual organs such as the uterus and the vagina may help create a more natural pelvic support system that would help women void better with a neobladder or whether doing some sort of reconstruction with essentially um, using some techniques from gynecology such as a sacred colpopexy might help to create a better situation for women to avoid having to use intermittent catheterization. 
And again, from the patient choice tool, you can see that really problematic issues with daytime urinary leakage for men are about 10%, for women about 20%. Catheterization rates um, really line up quite well with what we saw at USC for men about 15% and women about 30% but more people do have leakage at night to seen in that last frame. And, and I actually think that sounds a little low compared to my clinical experience. Um, I think next, um, actually we can um, discuss metabolic complications and that will se segue into Dr. Pohar's segment of the slides. Um, so let me end my slideshow and stop sharing my screen.